Time is up. I can put it right there. Let's put it right there. Right there. Time is up. Time is up, folks. Thank you. Any more quizzes up here? Please hand your quizzes in towards the end of each row. Any more quizzes? Thank you. Any more quizzes out here? Time is up. Okay, last call. <clears throat> Any more quizzes up here? Okay. No more quizzes, right? Any more quizzes? Okay. Because you have two different quizzes, 7.5 and 1 and 8 in the other. Same quiz? Sorry, what was the word? 7.5 and 8, depending on which quiz you got. <laughs> payout ratio is what you pay out, right? Dividends divided by earnings. So 1 minus the payout ratio is the retention ratio. For what? What were you trying to solve for? Yeah, you have to multiply by one minus. No, you have to multiply by the payout ratio, yeah. right? It's dividend. It's a dividend discount model, right? Okay, <laughs> so a couple of things. One is uh, the usual. The usual rules apply. As soon as the quiz is done, I will let you know. You can come pick it up. Okay. The second is your DCFs over the weekend. I got through probably three quarters of them. So I have a little, probably about 75 left in your class and 100 in the other. And I hope to get them back to you probably by Wednesday, because I have to grade this, obviously, before I do the DCF. Okay. So when you get whatever you got back on the DCF, if you did not get a response on your DCF, wait a couple of days before you freak out, because I haven't, as I said, there are quite a few left. Okay. And for most of you, the DCF was really about this part of your story. Maybe you want to work on it. This, you know. So essentially, it was really about finessing your story. and getting it right. Okay. So you want to talk about the quiz? So the first question looked too easy, right? Because I gave you the growth rate, I gave you the dividends in year three, you just multiplied by 1.03 and you were off to the races. But there was one big catch. What is a big catch? That the return on equity will not change over time. 
Think of an equation, right? What's the equation for growth? Return in equity times retention ratio is equal to growth. If I give you two out of the three, the third has to be calculated. So in the first three years, what did I give you? I gave you the growth rate indirectly because you saw the income growing, and I gave you the retention ratio or the payout ratio, which is enough. If you have the growth rate and the retention ratio, what can you solve for? ROE. ROE. Once you get the ROE, get to year four, what did I say happens? Your growth drops, but the return equity stays the same. One equation, I've given you the two of the three variables. What do you have to solve for in year four? You have to solve for a new retention ratio, which means you can't take your three dividends and grow them out one year because you're going to significantly undervalue your company. And here's why. What are you making them do that? You're making them act like a mature company and pay dividends like a growth company. That company is not going to be worth much. That was really the heart of problem one, because if you just take dividends 1.03, it's a one-minute problem, right? You get a value. But what you're doing then is you're violating the stable return equity. On the second problem, it's just a question of do you remember what to add and what to subtract? So what should you add? The minority holding in another company. What should you subtract? The portion of the majority holding that doesn't belong to you. So if you put the, if you say, look, I got you know, just a sign off and there's plus on one and minus, that's it. That's the whole thing is, you know, if I'd given you, this is just a what if, what if instead of giving you the consolidated company's numbers in the first row, I'd given you the parent company numbers in the front, first row? I almost thought about doing it. See how many of you would be, worse. if I'd given you the parent company numbers, what would you have had to do? you'd have had to add both. But this time, you'd have added the 10% of company B and the 60% of whatever this third company is. So watch out for those things. The cross holdings are a mess. You forget what to add, what to subtract. And the last problem, what was the key? I told you the markets price this company right, right? Which means what? That they've taken into account the options and they've come up with the value of equity. I gave you the value of the options. So really, the only question is, do you add that number or subtract that number? Because so should you add it or subtract it? You have to add it, and here's why. To get to the value of the equity in the common stock, you're just going back, you're reversing the process, right? Because if, when you value traditionally, you start at the top and you work down to value of equity, you subtract the option to get a value of the common stock. Here I've given you the stock price and the number of shares. You actually have to work backwards, which means you should be adding the value of the options, and the rest is just pure algebra, right? Because the cash flow is given. You know, a couple of people asked where the reinvestment rate was. I was really trying to help you. I gave you the cash flow directly. Don't go looking a gift horse in the mouth, right? I could have given you net income, in which case you have had to return an equity and all the rest of the crap. But I assume that the first prompt tested you on that already. What's the point of testing you again? So it's, it is done. We're on to the last phases of intrinsic value. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that third phase of the life cycle. We've talked about young growth companies. Well, and on your, as I was looking at your, um, at your valuations, a lot of you have picked young growth companies to value. Companies like Salesforce and, you know, um, Yelp. Yelp was a big one. Tableau was another one. A lot of young growth company valuations. And I don't know what you hoped from me, but all I did was I affirmed your numbers and said, okay, this is your story and this is your valuation, tell it. And that's all I could tell. All I could point out was inconsistency. If you told me a story that was inconsistent with the numbers that you were telling me, then I said, you told me this company's under margin pressure. Why are your margins going up? So to the extent of the feedback, if you were expecting something very specific, I was going to, I, can't, I couldn't give it to you because it's your story, your valuation, and all I can do is let you take ownership of it. Yeah. But a few of you were valuing declining companies. Most of you avoided them. Why? Because they're depressing. And if you think about what makes declining companies so difficult to value, let's ask those four questions. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets, and you look at your history, what do you see in a declining company? Revenues are flat or declining and margins are falling through the floor. When I ask you what's the value of growth, you start laughing. What's the value of growth here? Basically, if I try to grow, I destroy value. So it's not a question of how quickly can I grow, it's often how quickly can I shrink. So you could actually end up with a negative reinvestment rate, which means, you know what a negative reinvestment rate basically means, right? Intuitively, you're shrinking the company, you're divesting assets, and declining growth. 
One of the problems with risk in a declining company is it's almost in motion because as you sell businesses and pay off debt, your debt ratio changes, your unlevered beta changes, you're getting out of country. So in a sense, you're almost like reversing the process of expansion. And when I ask you, when will your company be a mature company, that you say that was 20 years ago. I mean, when was J.C. Penney a mature company? It was a long, long time ago. For you, the end game might not be going concern forever. It might be the end is near. I'm going to liquidate. So everything becomes a lot darker. So let's think about how you deal with decline. The first is that psychological. You've got to get over that psychological barrier. You know what that is? Using a negative growth rate for the high growth period. It's really not a high growth period. It's an abnormal growth period. It seems unnatural, right, to put a minus 5% for the next five years. But if you're valuing JCPenney, that might be an optimistic scenario that revenue... In fact, if you're valuing any retailer, it's dark out there, whether it's Bed Bath & Beyond or Best Buy. And it's dark because Amazon has destroyed the business. So when you do the valuation, clearly it's that getting... Over. And when you put in red declining growth, you've got to think through how this will work. If you're a rational manager at a declining company, what are the first assets you're going to sell? Your best assets or your worst assets? You're going to try to get rid of your worst assets. Then you might go to the best assets, but basically the, as you shrink, you're hoping to get rid of those. So if you're a retailer, ba the bad stores first, collect some real estate, so your reinvestment rate will be negative as you get out of those stores. But hopefully as you do this, your return on capital will rise. You see why? Because you take your worst stores out of the mix, you're hoping that what's left may not make you create value, but at least you're not destroying value. So what you're trying to do is make your company smaller over time and hope that you can get it to a point where it can at least earn its cost of capital. You're saying that's not a very uplifting story. It is what it is. You can't tell rosy fairy tales about retailing companies. That might be the best you can aspire for. So it's more a psychological thing than anything else, but here's what can get in the way of your valuation. We said a rational manager at a declining firm will shrink the firm and try to make it a self-standing firm. But we know that managers are not always rational. We talked about the aging process, that companies fight aging. So if I put you in a CEO of JCPenney, how do you become a star? You turn the company around, right? What is turning the company around? Often it means making the company big again. So your worst case scenario often when you value these declining firms is a management that is in denial. In which case, what are you going to see at this declining firm? They're going to try to grow. By doing what? Taking projects that earn less than the cost of capital. It'll show up as a much lower value, but you're saying these managers are essentially in a declining firm, but they're trying to grow. It's actually hurting the value. I wish I could stop it, but I cannot. So if you have a management in denial, that might actually mean that you actually get growth, but it's a worse kind of growth, where the return capital is way below the cost of capital. So that's if you have declined. And here's my valuation of JCPenney from a couple of years ago. Notice the top line, revenue growth is a negative number. Why? Because I don't see uplifting growth here. I see shrinking. And this is with a management that understands what's going on. As they shrink the firm, I'm hoping they can improve their margins because they're getting rid of their worst stores. And by the time I get to year 10, I'm hoping as a much smaller firm, because you look at their revenues, their revenues are about 20% lower than they are today, that what they've created now is a slimmer firm that can at least earn its cost of capital. So all I'm doing here is hoping that they can get back to a company that's running in place. With that shrinking firm, and the, I apply a tax rate. So basically, if you look at the key differences, negative growth rate translates into negative reinvestment. Negative reinvestment is basically the divesting of assets, the closing of stores, and hopefully getting real estate. And there you might push back and say, maybe I will not get that money back. Because think of how much difficulty Eddie Lampert had. Because this was his plan at Sears. He wanted to shut the stores down, get the money out, and he discovered it was a lot more difficult to do than it looked. So he's finally, at the end of 10 years, he threw in the towel. But to the extent that those negative cash flows represent, uh, no, are divestitures, you have to make sure that you can get those cash flows back. Your free cash flows are higher than your after-tax operating income. On many of you built your own spreadsheets. I was pretty mean to some of you. And part of the reason was when I got to line 135 of your spreadsheet, I was exhausted. But here's what I was checking if you built your own spreadsheet. Many of you had lots of detail in your spreadsheets. 
you had 15 line items for your operating expenses, seven parameterization. I didn't even look at the lines. I finally looked at your after-tax operating income, and then I'll skip down to your free cash flow to the firm, and I compared those numbers. Well, you know what I was looking for, right? In your top line, you were telling me how you're going to grow, 10, 15, 20%. I was looking at the difference, and if you're a growing firm, I expected your free cash flow to the firm be less than your after-tax operating. You can't dance around that. But if you have a declining firm, I expect your free cash flow to the firm to be at least higher than your, than your after-tax operating income because you're making the company smaller. So I discount the cash flows back. I come up with the value. If you look at their bond rating, the bond ratings agencies are looking at them as a single B rated company. There's a 20% chance of failure. And if you, they fail, I assume the liquidation will bring in only 50% of book value. Because liquidation is in your hurry, you're selling things, you're going to get the best price you can. So here you have for JCPenney two valuations. One is of a declining firm that finds a foothold as a much smaller company, and I valued it. But there's a very real chance that the decline gets even worse and the debt starts to kick in that they won't make it. So that's with decline being front and center. But with JCPenney, distress did not seem to be the front and center, at least when I valued them. Now I'm going to give you a second scenario. This is when you have a declining firm and a lot of debt. Here your dangers get doubled because not only are you worrying about decline, you're worried about the fact that you will not make it. And remember we said the discounted cash flow valuation is a value of your company as a going concern. You can almost guarantee that if you do a discounted cash flow valuation of a distressed company and you stop there, you overvalue the company. Why? Because there's a very real chance your company will not make it. So you've got to complete the process. What does that mean? You've got to ask two more questions. What is the probability that I will not make it and try to address it as best as I can? And then ask, what will happen if I don't make it? I have to liquidate, I have to sell, what will I get on my assets? What kind of assets do I have? So again, I'm going to give you an example of a company that some of you might be familiar with. It's called Las Vegas Sands. It's a casino company. Now here's the thing to remember about casino companies. They all seem to be run by megalomaniacs. Steve Wynn and Wynn Resorts. There's something about casinos that pulls a certain kind of personality. And Las Vegas Sands is run by another megalomaniac called Sheldon Adelson. And he owns 52% of the shares in the company. Hold on to that because it's going to become part of the story. Las Vegas Sands was one of the fastest growing casino companies of the last decade. They were building casinos everywhere. Macau, in Singapore, they built this monstrous hotel called Marina Bay Sands. Don't go there. It's like a boat on top of a hotel. You know, it's like Noah's Ark got stuck somewhere. No. But that's what casino companies do. They build these buildings that are monuments to bad taste. But they're huge, and they cost a few hundred million dollars. So he's building all these casinos, each costing a hundred. So to build these casinos, you need money, right? What are the two ways a business can raise money? They can use equity, or they can use debt. Las Vegas Sands kept borrowing and borrowing. Why? Why didn't they want to use equity? What does equity, use, equity mean? They have to issue shares. And if they issue shares, outsiders are going to buy it. And if they buy it, what happens to Adelson's share of the company? The 52% could become 49%. So this is where the megalomania becomes part of the story. Because you don't want to give up control, Las Vegas Sands borrowed and built another casino. Borrowed and built. And as long as times are good, nobody notices you're playing this game, right? They, they say, oh, great earnings per share, great growth. And then you had 2008, and the bottom fell out for two reasons. One is the economy slowed down around the world. People coming to casinos dropped off in numbers, so they were not getting the revenues that they did. The second was the default spreads on debt jumped up, and all of a sudden banks wanted to be paid right away. Las Vegas Sands was in the squeeze. The valuation I'm going to show you for Las Vegas Sands was from February 2009. This is four or five months into the crisis. And as I was doing the valuation, I was reading all these news stories about how Las Vegas Sands would not make it through the next six months. So I filed it away, I read the news stories, and I sat down and did a DCF valuation of Las Vegas Sands. And I fixed them on the spreadsheet. As I said, fixing companies on spreadsheets is really easy to do. So what do I need to do to fix a troubled casino company with a lot of debt on the spreadsheet? I improved the margins. I brought the casino players back into the game. Their earnings became more positive. I lowered their debt ratio over time as they paid. So on the spreadsheet, I made them a nice, healthy company with lots of profits. 
and I put a big terminal value on the company, discounted it all back, and came back with a value of $8.12 per share. Stock was trading at 425. We said investing is an act of faith. So ask me the question. So I have a value of, of 812. The stock is trading at 425. To see if I have enough faith in my valuation, what's the question you ask me? Would I buy? And I've had no qualms about buying undervalued stocks, but in this case, my answer was no. And that led to some soul searching because if I truly believe my value is 812, and I, I know it's not that there's anything in this DCF that I have a problem with because I've made some reasonable assumptions about margins and debt ratios. You know what's holding me back? What was all the stories I was reading before I did my DCF? That the company might not make it. This is the value of Las Vegas Sands if it makes it back to health and becomes a solid. Is there a chance? Sure. But is there a chance that might not happen? At least in February 2009, it was a clear and present danger. So what do I need to do to complete my assessment. I need to estimate a probability that Las Vegas Sands will not make it and what will happen to my equity if they don't. Let's take the first half of the question. If I want to estimate a probability that a company will not make it, what are some of the things I could look at? I could look at default rate, but it's after the fact. So before it defaults, it's the zero default rate, right? So they haven't defaulted yet. So I have to be proactive. What could I look at? You could look at how much cash, how much debt, you could look at debt coverage ratios, how variable the earnings are. Maybe you can compute some kind of a ratio that predicts default. Is there such a ratio? There's something called the Altman Z-score. Ed you know, has made his, his entire academic life around the, around the Altman Z-score. What does it do? It gives you a score that assesses the probability of default. You know what? A version of the Altman Z-score has been used by banks probably for as long as they've been lending, where they look all but there's an even easier proxy than the Altman Z score, right? You could look at, for, first, if they're bonds, you can actually look at the rating. And there, if you look at S&P and Moody's websites, they actually tell you what the default rates are by ratings class. So if you're triple B rated, they'll tell you in the 10 years after you buy a triple B bond, there's a 3% chance they will default if you have a single B. So one is to take your rating and assess a probability of default on it. But if the bonds are traded, there is information in that bond price I might be able to use to estimate a probability of default. In the case of Las Vegas Sands, I actually found a bond. It was a seven-year bond with a 6.375% coupon rate and was trading at 529. You know, bonds have a face value of 1,000. So if a bond is trading at par, it's 1,000. So this bond is trading way below par. So already you can see the bond market is terrified. One of the things you've got to give the bond market credit for is it's incredibly focused on one thing and one thing alone, which is, are we going to get paid? Are we going to get paid? It's not like the equity market where you get distracted by growth and cash flows and shiny objects. The bond market is focused on default risk alone. So here's what I did. I went and looked at the bond. Now, normally, how do we price bonds? How, do, how are we taught to price bonds? What do we do? We take promised coupons and face value, and we discount them back at a risk adjusted, a default risk adjusted interest rate, right? I'm not going to do that. Instead of taking promised coupons, I'm going to take expected coupons. You're saying, what the heck is an expected coupon? For you to get the promised coupon, what has to happen? The company's got to be around. So I took each promised coupon and I multiplied by one minus the property will not make it. And of course, this will compound over time. So now my cash flows are risk adjusted, right? And if they're risk adjusted, what discount rate should I now apply on these cash flows? A risk-free rate because I can't double count for risk. So here's what I know. I know the price of the bond. I know the promised coupon. I know the risk-free rate. What's the only number in that equation I don't have? That probability of distress. Have you used the sol solver function in Excel or the gold seek function? That's what I did. I said, look, I've given you the promised coupon. I've given you the risk-free rate. I've given you the price of the bond. Solve for what the probability of distress has to be for 529 to be a fair price. It came back and said it was 13.54% on an annual basis. Now, where's my big value in my discounted cash flow valuation? It comes from lasting until year 10, right? And if I believe the bond market is saying there's a 13.5% chance I will fail in year one, that's just in year one, then you have year two, then year three. In other words, to survive to year 10, I've got to survive 10 years in a row, which means it's 86% chance of surviving. 
no compound attendance. And if you work it through, the bond market's message to me is a very depressing one. Given the bond price, there's about a 23% chance I will make it to your 10. Kind of clarifies matters, right? I have a going concern value of $8.12, but that is true only in the 23% of the time I make it. The remaining 77% of the time, what happens? I'm not able to make my bond payments. I have to liquidate. What does that mean? I have to sell all those casinos and hotels. How, do you th how many potential buyers do you think there are for those casinos? Probably other casino companies. And the problem is when you're in trouble, guess what's true for them as well? They're in trouble as well. Don't expect to get face value for the casinos. You can't go and say, I spent a billion for the casinos. Give me the billion back. What you're going to get on the casinos is going to be a portion of the book value. In this case, I assume that you would get about $2.8 billion, which is about half the book value. And I'm probably being optimistic here. That, of course, is way below the face value of the debt, which means if you liquidate, my equity is going to be worth nothing. Thank God it's floored at nothing. Right? Because if this is a, if you didn't have limited liability, can you imagine you'd be getting calls from your broker saying, send me another 10000 on that $100 share. So the worst that can happen is zero. So my expected value for Las Vegas Sands is $8.12 times 23% plus zero times the 77%, which is $1.92. Question? Well, it really is business specific. Here, in fact, I didn't even spend too much time because the debt outstanding was $7.7 .7 billion. Mm -hmm. Even if I've got the entire book value back, I'm not going to cover the debt. The reality is, if you liquidate, your equity is almost always worth nothing because you're not liquidating by choice. You're liquidating because there's a gun to your head saying, you know. So if you're having trouble, just put a zero equity value. In some cases, if you have real estate holdings and lots, the key is what kind of assets are you liquidating? If it's assets with lots of potential buyers, then you'd get a much higher percentage of the value. If it's assets that are very specific buyers or relatively few players, it's going to be worth a lot less. So distressed companies, that's it. Now, when I do this with analysts, their question is, why isn't it already in the discounted cash flow valuation? What's the only place in a discounted cash flow valuation to show risk? Discount rates. So the question is, why don't we just use higher discount rates for these companies? Why is that not going to work? Because higher discount rates capture continuous risk. So if I'm concerned about cash flows going up and down, I can hike up the discount rate. Think of how high the discount rate is, has to be for your value to go to zero tomorrow. It's got to be infinity. Discount rates are not malleable instruments. They're not way, places you can show this kind of risk. In fact, I'll make a general statement. If you're valuing a company with truncation risk, it can be this kind of risk. It can be a startup where you have failure. It can be a Venezuelan company that's going to be nationalized. Don't try to bring those discrete risks into discount rates. It was never designed for that kind of risk due to separate valuations. One is a going concern, one with that discrete risk built in, take the expected value. In statistics, these are called decision trees. We learn them in statistics when we throw them away. They're actually very effective ways of capturing any kind of discrete risk. In fact, this is exactly what, how I approach easy jet valuation because initially I thought about can I bring all these Brexit risks into the discount rate? And my response was, are you crazy? Nobody has any idea how this is going to evolve. So rather than try to bring them into this discount rate, I did three scenarios, discrete risk, three different scenarios, and essentially three very different valuations. Any questions on distress or discrete? I to keep, because remember, I can have only one unknown in Excel, right? So in a sense, if I want to make this more complex, I'll have to find multiple bonds. So let's say you said, look, I'm taking one annualized probability and attaching it. I think the risk of default is greatest in the first three years, and then it drops off, which tends to be true. Then I'd go looking for a three-year bond and a 10-year bond. I'd use the three-year bond to solve for the probability of default in the first three years and get a higher number. I'll solve for the 10-year bond and then take out, it's almost like solving for forward rates, which is if I know, so, but you need to find multiple bonds on the same company that are traded where you can trust the price.
The problem is you need, you need a bond. If you have a small company with no bonds or bank loans, then you either have to use a synthetic rating and use the table to look up the property of default. And I have that on my website. I actually have default properties that go with ratings. Or you have to use, you know, do you know what a probit is in statistics? A probit looks like a regression, but it's actually used to estimate the probability of something happening. And it's actually, the way you do it is actually very clever. You take all publicly traded companies for the last 30 years, and you put zero or one on them. Zero if they survive, one if they fail. So basically, you have a big data set, and you have, let's say, 3,355 companies that failed and 26,000 companies that, so you have zeros and ones. And then you throw in variables that you think affect failure, like cash, how much debt you have, how variable your earnings are. And you run what looks like a regression, but your dependent variable now becomes a number between zero and one. And what it actually gives you is, given the history of failure of companies, what is the probability of default failure? So I plug in the numbers into this regression-like number, I get a probability of failure. It's a very clever technique, but it has a lot of noise in it. So I might have to stretch to do the probability of default, but I think we need to start to think more carefully about it. Let's talk about emerging market companies. If you have an emerging market company, I have the same four questions. There, what are your cash flows from existing assets? What's the value of growth? How risky are your cash flows? And when will your company be a mature company? I'll give you my biggest problem with emerging market companies is the answers to these questions might have less to do with the company and more to do with the country. You could be the best managed Venezuelan company on the face of the earth, but guess what? You're looking like an in shambles right now through no fault of your own. There's always a country component to every single number. So when I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? Show me the numbers from last year. But if you're a Brazilian company, you're already giving me, giving me excuses, right? Why were your numbers so bad last year? The Brazilian government is in shambles, there's car washes, there's political scandals. And you probably are right, but still, it means that your numbers are now condemned. Then I ask you, what's the value of growth? You're saying, well, it depends on how well the government handles the future. So how risky are you? Well, it depends on what happens to Brazil as a country. When will I be, when you become a mature firm? It depends on whether the country makes it or not. In other words, everything becomes about the country. And there's a danger here, because then every company valuation you do in an emerging market becomes an examination of the emerging market. So I'm going to suggest a few things about emerging markets that you might want to keep in mind. Especially when you're valuing companies in really risky emerging markets, you're going to be tempted to punish the company over and over and over again. Because at every stage, you remind yourself, but it is a Nigerian company. But it is a Nigerian company. You know what this is going to lead to, right? When you do your cash flows, you say, oh, it's a Nigerian company. I should be more careful about my growth rates. I'll lose a lower growth rate. You get to the risk-free rate, you might say, well, let me use a Nigerian government bond rate. Why? Just because it's higher. And it's a Nigerian company. A higher discount rate makes sense. Then you look up a beta for the business and you come up with 0.7 by looking at the global beta, but it's a Nigerian company. I'll use 1.4. Then you get to the equity risk premium. Now you say, okay, it's a Nigerian company. I'll use a big equity. Do you see what's happening? You're banging the company around the knees with a baseball bat multiple times and you expect it to keep walking. If you're going to deal with country risk, it has to be with a scalpel. There's a reason I try to keep it in the equity risk premium. That way, when you see my valuation, you know where I put country risk. Whereas if I put it all over the place, you have no idea where I put it. This way, at least, you can look at that number and say, that's too low or that's too high because it's in one place. If you have an emerging market company that is entirely in one market or two markets, you can use the Lambda approach. Where, you know. But if you're in multiple emerging markets, you're looking at an MBEV, it's all over Latin America, use that weighted average equity risk premium. Let that take care of country risk and move on. So here's an example. This was the valuation of Embraer. Embraer, for those of you familiar with it, is a Brazilian aerospace company. It's actually a very well-run, well-regarded company. In fact, many of you who take short-haul flights in the US will either be on a Bombardier or an Embraer because they make these, you know, you, you know the, the aircraft where you get on, they have no carry-on, they make you check it at the gate, and they say you find it, you might not find it when you get off at the other side. The seats are like little... No. Those are all Embraer and Bombardier flights. So if you fly from here to Buffalo, I don't know why you'd want to go to Buffalo, you're going to be on either an Embraer or Bombardier. You're not on a Boeing 737 MAX. So at least that's good news now. Right? <laughs> so, it is, so this is a valuation of Embraer for way back in time, almost in 2004. So if you look at the valuation, here's what I, in 2008. 
So basically, the first thing I decided to do was do my valuation in US dollars. And in 2008, the reason was very simple. The Brazilian government still hadn't started issuing long-term bonds in real. So I was stuck with US dollars. So this is desperation that's trying to do it. So all the numbers you see are US dollar rates. And you can see the numbers. In the most recent year, the reinvestment rate was about 56%. And when I made my forecast, I kind of did what I do with traditional companies, put in a reinvestment rate. So the numerator looks very much like it did, as long as I keep my focus on the fact that everything is being done in US dollars. You know why that matters, right? If I ask Embraer managers about growth, they might give me a growth rate, but I have to be careful and make sure that growth. So everything in my cash flows is done in US dollars. So my inflation rate in my cash flows is a US dollar inflation rate. Let's go below the line. To build up to my cost of capital, I start with the T-bond rate. Not the Brazilian government dollar bond rate, but the T-bond rate. Why? Because I want a risk-free rate. The beta that I use is a beta for aerospace companies times a mature market premium. But you're saying, Embraer is not in a mature market. You're right. And I capture the fact that Embraer is a risky company using a lambda. If you remember, the lambda came from running a regression of Embraer returns against a Brazilian CDS. So essentially, it tells me that Embraer is not a very risky company. At least it's not as exposed as much to Brazilian country risk as the typical Brazilian company because it gets 95% of its revenues outside Brazil. If you don't like the lambda approach, my suggestion is take a weighted average then, equity risk premium based on where it does business. I build my country risk then into my discount rate. I discount my cash flows back at the dollar cost of capital. So the rest of the valuation looks like any other valuation, but my country risk shows up in my discount rate. What I get as a value per share is $9.53. And if I want to convert into a real number, all I have to do is multiply that by the current exchange rate. Because once I value per share, it's today's numbers, and I can convert it into reais per share. Stock was actually trading at a slightly higher price, but it is, I mean, based on my story and my valuation, that 15.7 is the value per share. So with emerging markets, try not to get carried away and punish the company for things it can't control. Basically, building in a higher discount rate, then let it go. Okay. Second, currency should never become front and center in your analysis. Why? Because if you do it right, you should get the same value no matter what currency you pick. So you shouldn't be sitting there saying, Russian company, I have to value it in rubles. You can value it in dollars as long as you stay consistent. Your biggest problem is making sure you stay consistent because it's so easy to fall into the trap if you're not explicit about currencies. So with emerging markets, always follow up any number you give me with a currency that you're doing it. So if you say the growth rate is 11% for Infosys, I'm waiting for the rest of the sentence, which is, Infosys is an Indian company, but you can give me the growth rate in rupees, you can give me it in dollars, always put in the currency, because otherwise you have no idea what the other person is hearing. And it's better to be explicit about currencies. Yeah? In those cases where they're dealing with discretionary portion of the currency, they often value it as a Yeah. The point that's being raised in some high inflation economies, accounting does inflation accounting, which means they screw it up in horribly bad ways. They do it with the best of intention, because what's the accountant saying? That thing you bought in Brazil 12 years ago, because inflation has been so high, we're going to write a book value using what inflation has been since then. You're saying, what's wrong with that? Because inflation is not a fact. It's an estimate, right? So where are you getting inflation? You're looking at some index. In the US alone, you can have CPI, PPI. And at least in the US, you have those numbers tend to agree. In countries like Brazil, you can have six different measures of inflation, all of which are different and all of which are wrong. And in countries where the government measures inflation, God help you. You know, in Venezuela, there is no inflation, at least according to the government. They've got this basket of goods with fixed prices, and they measure the price, and say, the price didn't change. The fact that nobody can buy anything in the basket is kind of irrelevant. So my point about inflation is when you adjust for inflation, we act like we're adjusting for facts, we're adjusting for estimates. And in fact, for, there was a period of almost 15 years in Brazil where accountants over-adjusted for inflation. What that meant was the book values of companies was the one country in the world where the price to book was actually well below one across the board because the book values kept getting inflated with inflation. But the inflation adjustment, it actually adds noise to the process. 
but it does mean that things like return and invested capital become trickier. Because if inflation actually does its job perfectly with inflation, where invested capital is being written up, if I divide after-tax operating income by the book value, you know what I should get? I should get a real return on capital. Which means if I want to convert it into a dollar number, it is a mess when it happens, even if it's done right, because it means that the numbers you're getting as ratios are not, no longer nominal numbers. If they're done perfectly, they're real numbers. If they're done imperfectly, they're somewhere between the two, which is the worst possible scenario. You don't even know what inflation to adjust for. If you have exchange, if you have exchange rate and current inflation losses, any kind of loss that you see on, a, on an income statement, if it's minus in one year, plus in another year, so exchange rates, for instance, the U.S. almost always even up. So if a U.S. company reports losses because of exchange rates, you've known. But if you're in a country with high, inf, uh, high inflation, the exchange rate losses will always be losses because you expect your currency to depreciate. Right? So if you're doing your analysis in the local currency, you're going to see the depreciation kick in. Then you might have to bring it in, because this isn't a one-time deal. This is coming from the... But I'll give you a better way to deal with it. When you, do, when you move across currencies, you need exchange rates. If you truly believe that inflation is what's driving it, your expected exchange rates should be driven by differences in inflation. It's purchasing power parity. And as long as you do that, all of this stuff will take care of itself on its own. Third, I mean, this is now, this is, can be true across the world because even in the U.S. you have this problem. But it is true that in many emerging markets, stockholders have little or no power. This is true in Asia. It's true in Latin America. Some of it is just culture. There are some cultures where I mean, Japanese investors for a long time would not question Japanese managers because you just didn't do it in Japan. Some of it is how the shareholding is set up. In Latin America, you've always had you know, common shares and preferred shares, which are really voting common stock and non-voting common stock, which means all the power is vested with the incumbent managers, often with the government in the background. You think, so what? We talked a little bit about this in the, startup, in the starting test last session, where we said when you value these companies, you're going to come up with the value, but these companies have very poor corporate governance. And that poor corporate governance has to show up somewhere. You're looking for a place to show it. Maybe a higher discount rate, maybe lower cash flows. You know. And we all kind of talked about this, this notion. But let me check you again. If you, should you discount the value? What do we decide about discounting the value for the lack of stockholder power? Should we or shouldn't we? And why not? You remember? Why shouldn't we discount the discounted cash flow value that we get for the lack of... Any time you discount a number after you're done, you've got to be careful. But in this case, why not? Because we're assuming that, that those are built into our cash flow. You don't even have to assume it. Who did that discounted cash flow valuation? You did, right? You don't have to assume a thing. Go back and check it what you did. If you built in low returns on capital for the next 15 years, less than the cost of capital, and you're assuming companies will keep reinvesting at that rate, you're not assuming insanity. You're assuming loss of power, which is these managers are going to continue to run the firm. So you don't even have to assume a thing. Go look at your own DCF valuation. If you fix a company and you made it into a well running company, then you might have to do that discounting because you've assumed something that might not be in your control. But if you've left the numbers as bad numbers, there's no discounting needed. So I'll give you an example, and this will be um, the last thing we do today. As I said, I grew up in Chennai, and you know, I go back once a year to visit my parents. My roots are very light there because I've been gone 45 years. I know almost no one in the city anymore. So I'm going to And every time I go back, I get called by somebody saying, can you come in and talk to us? And we remember I talked about the tube investments where they kept trying to borrow more money, and every time they borrowed so. I'm sorry, that t t uh, t uh, Titan watches. So this is another company that, you know, where I've known the people who run the company for a long time. So a lot of, you know, about 15, 20 years ago when I was on my uh, back home, they said, can you come in and do a valuation of our company? And I said, why? And they said, we're being, we, we, we have, the market's pricing at like four times or four and a half times earnings. We don't think it's fair and we want you to confirm for us that it's not fair. And I said, you do know that when I come in and value the company, 
There are no guarantees about what I'll find. And they said, no, no, we'll. So I went in and did evaluations. It's a company called Tubin. It's part of a family run company. It's, it's a publicly traded, but it's family run. So let me show you the numbers. And as I go through the numbers, you tell me whether you see a problem in the company and why I'm not sure in value. That company, it's reinvesting a lot. Okay? So this is all in repeat terms. They're reinvesting almost in the most recent year, 113% of their after-tax operating come back into the business. So when I did my forecast, I actually lowered that reinvestment rate down to 60% because the number jumped up and down and said you're reinvesting a lot. They're earning about a 9.2% return on capital. That doesn't look bad, right, if you think in dollar terms. But this was in 2000, and the inflation rate in rupees was in double digits. 9.2% was way below their cost of capital, which is 16.9%. So they're growing a lot, but they're growing by taking investments that are well below their cost of capital. I left it as is because this is a family-run company. They don't even think there's a problem because their measure is we're making money. Why are you giving us any, uh, why are you hassling us? And essentially, I locked in that 9.2% return on capital forever, which is a real damage because then you're continuing to destroy value in perpetuity. And I came up with a value of about 62 rupees. They were trading at 102. They were not happy. Because they wanted me to come. They, so they want to know what's going on. And initially, they, their reaction was, you're coming up with too low a value because you're making us grow at too low a rate. I said, what do you want to do? So why don't you increase the reinvestment rate? I said, OK, I can do that for you. And if I increase the reinvestment rate, guess what happens to the value per share? The more I increase it, the lower the value. Because as you increase the reinvestment rate here, your value per share will get smaller because you're taking more and more bad products.